Yeah, so it's, it's amazing how, how time has changed. You know, we started in January 2019, it's May 2020, and today it's the final ascent. So a lot of people are talking about bouncing back from this, uh, this crisis. I say, I don't want to bounce back. I want to spring forward. I want to bounce forward. And I want to take you with me as well as we, we bounce forward into this, this new world that's ahead of us. So you've heard me say once or twice that never stop learning because the world around you never stops teaching. I think we've learned a little bit in the last couple of months. So, uh, and we've learned a lot in our journey from, uh, from January. Uh, and we've learned a lot in the last couple of, uh, couple of months uh, in this new world. But you know, there are some timeless principles which, are, uh, which never change. Um, the learning is, is, needs to be constant. We have to continue to learn uh, and evolve. Um, and the second is we have to be guided by a compass. And that compass, um, for a lot of us, is the head, heart, and hands. So the head, in terms of your strategy, in terms of what you're, what you're learning, um, the heart, in terms of what, uh, what we feel that we want to do, the compassion that we have for our patients, the fact that we want to do our very best work for our patients, and the hands um, allowing us clinically to do that. Because as hygienists and dentists, uh, we are one of the most analog uh, services uh, that are out there. Uh, although there's been a lot of digital dentistry, um, we're not going to be replaced with, uh, with anything digital. It'll still require us um, having hands-on, so we have, to, we have to adapt. So yeah, so you know, I, was, I left you March 4th, and uh, I left you with this slide, if you remember. And uh, I was on my way to Scotland for an oral cancer conference, and, um, and as uh, some of you know, um, that story changed a little bit. And um, Scotland is really nice, but uh, I came back with COVID. I think a lot of you, uh, you heard about that. And um, I did a little video about this, um, which, uh, which many of you have seen. Fortunately, um, it wasn't, uh, wasn't terrible for me. Uh, I was only, um, I, I was in quarantine for five weeks, uh, but I emerged and I'm like feeling better than ever. So, and I'm happy to tell you that I'm, I'm through it, but it is uh, not something to be taken lightly. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, stages to, the, um, to going through a crisis. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, you know, so I would, had to get over getting sick and getting better, but also, you know, we had to deal with this, uh, this terrible condition that we had where the world shut down on us. So one of the frameworks, which I found was really, really important to me and, and made a lot of sense is the three stages of a crisis that you can, uh, that you can be part of. The first stage is when you're in panic and fear. So you run to the basement and you're, you feel really threatened, you feel scared. People start doing irrational things um, and they watch and consume all kinds of information, share it, spread it. There's a lot of negativity, a lot of emotion, a lot of negative feelings. And it's just, it's, it's our reaction to this panic, to being in a situation where we're just really, we don't know how to do anything. And uh, you know, I think everyone went through part of that stage and hopefully, um, Today, a lot of us are on the main floor. So on the main floor, you come out of the basement and now you can kind of see the world a little bit better. You don't have a helicopter view, you don't have an overall view, but you develop a sense of maturity about the situation. You realize that you can't control things and there's a certain amount of control that you, that you know that you can't have right now, but the next best, best thing is the ability to be flexible. So, during this time, you sort of filter the emotions, you become more comfortable with the situation as it is, and you take a bit of control. And just by knowing that you don't have a lot of control, that gives you some control. Where we want to head to is the top floor. So we can see the sun, we can have a holistic overview of everything, and we're able to, to show empathy and, and to really show up and lead our teams and lead our patients. And during this phase, you develop an adaptability and you start making really good decisions that aren't based on irrational fears. But you have to work yourself out from the basement to the, to the top floor. And one of the best ways to do this is not alone. 
it's through collaboration with, uh, with our network. And that's why I think it's, it's really great that you're here today. And, and hopefully we can, we can work through uh, some of these thoughts together. The problem is sometimes you, you take a step back and you start, you get some information and this puts you back into the basement or puts you down a level. And, and this is okay because you, you realize that there are levels and that you can, you can negotiate this, this pathway. So really our choice is to bounce forward, to bounce up the steps and to develop this adaptability and the ability to make good sense, sensible decisions. So you've seen this uh, graphic, I'm sure. This, is, uh, this shows us the workers who face the greatest risk of a virus. And this was in the New York Times. And this axis is your exposure to the disease. And this is the physical proximity to others. And we have nurses in the big circle here. We have dentists here. But who is at the top at scoring a perfect 100? And that's, that's the dental hygienist, right? So, uh, you're the closest in physical proximity and, and you have a high risk of, of developing this. So we really need to have mechanisms that keep, keep you safe, that keep your patients safe. So um, how that's going to be is going to be dependent on how the colleges are going to regulate us, right? So we have to hopefully that there'll be some really positive alignment between the College of, of Hygienists and the College of Dentists and public health. And you know what? I'm really, I'm really happy with... Um, you know, with how, how careful Ontario is being, because they're handling this much better than, than almost anywhere else. Because there are really, there's four categories that you have to think about when you're thinking about um, COVID patients. Uh, the first category are those that have recovered and they know they have the disease. This is where I fit in. You know, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to give plasma and help other people. Uh, I know I've had this and there's a strong chance that I, I'm not going to have it again, but you never know. This, 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 we don't know what the evidence is for sure on that. You have a whole group that have recovered but didn't know they had the disease. So that's revealed through antibody testing. And um, until we have accurate antibody testing, we really don't know how big that category is. Uh, you can speculate, but um, you know, a lot of people I've talked to have said, yeah, I was sick in the fall. I was like, had this nagging thing going on for a few weeks and you know, I might've had it. It might be, no, might be good to know that I've had it. But so we got that category um, and we don't know how big that is. The third category is we have people that are currently contagious and they may or may not be aware that they have the disease. So they could be a couple of days before showing symptoms. They could be four or five days after showing symptoms. We just don't know, but our guidelines um, are generally written for this category because these are the infectious patients and you want to be able to avoid getting sick. And, um, you know, this is, this is the category that the, the regulations are, are written for. But this isn't the biggest category. The biggest category is everybody else who doesn't fit into the first three where they don't have the disease and they're petrified they're going to get it. And worst of all, they're, they're petrified that they're going to get it either going to visit you or it may be you that's worried that you're gonna get sick from, from seeing patients. So we have to manage these, uh, these characteristics really well and come up with a strategy that gives us the confidence and um, gives us the ability to do our best work for our patients. The thing that I'm most concerned about um, with this, this crisis is the second wave, the possible second wave. Um, that's the part that really concerns me. So I think the strategy that Ontario has right now to get the first wave uh, right is really a, a, a wonderful uh, service that they're doing. And although it's really tough being home, um, by doing it this way, I think it's our best chance to avoid that, that second wave. There's a site called Worldometer, um, which is really a, a valuable site. I'm on this every day. And it sort of shows where the different countries are in terms of their success with their strategies. And um, it's interesting to follow the countries in Europe that had this problem a month or two before we had it and to see how they're, how they're dealing with it versus how, um, how we are doing. And one of the most important ways to look at this, I think, is to look at the total number of cases that we have and divide it by the number of tests. So if we have the number of cases divided by number of tests, that gives you a positivity rate. 
So I'm, I'm very happy that, um, that Canada's positivity rate is around 6%. Uh, in the States, it's 11 or 12%. And a few days ago in Brazil, it was almost 50%. It's better, it's better now, they're, they're doing more testing. But it goes to show how, um, how well our, our, our systems are working. So certainly they're not perfect, but um, this is a pretty safe place to be. Uh, if you can't make it to New Zealand, I guess. So. I'm also really optimistic that there's going to be a lot of work to do when we return. You think about our poor patients that, you know, that we've had to push their appointments out, and especially our perio patients where, you know, if they're behind and, and by, like, they miss an appointment by a month, it it's a really puts them in a more critical area. So by having them uh, not, have the care that, not have the care that they've needed, um, they're going to be desperately waiting for us to do our best work for them. So, um, so that's something that's very different from, say, a restaurant, where if you have a restaurant and you've had to close for three months, the customers aren't going to come back and eat three times the amount of food. Um, whereas, you know, our service is, is really important, and we want to we want to be able to, to do that, and it's not going away. In fact, it's it's getting worse. Um, there's information everywhere, and. Uh, I, I want to direct you to some good information um, because there's there's a lot of a mess out there. We got called it informational obesity, where people are gorging themselves on bad information, and you just take all this stuff and you, you don't know where to trust it. This is a, a website called Up to Date. Um, so it's Up to Date, and this is used in hospitals and in settings where point of care clinicians go on this to get the best sort of most current information about things. Um, and the nice part is it's free until the end of May. It's usually over $1,000 a, a year, um, but it's free until the end of May. So uptodate.com, uh, you can subscribe for, 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 the, for the rest of the month, and it gives you a really good resource to look up any sort of health uh, issue, and it gives you the same information that, uh, that physicians would rely on. The second is we've, um, we've put together a... Um, a handout for you about just questions and answers that, that we thought were really helpful and germane for you to help your patients. So those are the resources. Um, and, you know, although this is an uncomfortable time, um, you know, it's, it's a chance for a new beginning as well. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about, uh, about that purpose. All right, so I've told you before that um, you know, I was in Bhutan, but I want to explore that journey with you because uh, I've given you sort of bits and pieces, but I want to tell you how that sort of comes together. Um, so from Bhutan, uh, which is very close to Nepal that I've shared with you before, um, and I've, I've explained that um, Bhutan is a very small country in between India and China. Um, China has 1.4 billion people, India below it, and in Bhutan, they have about 800,000 people. So you think it's a community, kind of like if you put Burlington and Hamilton together, something like that. You know, it's not a, not a huge area, but um, everybody knows everybody. And uh, it's, it's a really nice little protected country. Um, they limit the number of tourists to, I think, 30 or 40,000 a year. And you're not allowed to visit on your own. You have to have a tour guide with you um, everywhere you go. Uh, they just, uh, that's one of the rules that they have. So um, look at this uh, scene. This was uh, Kathmandu. Can you, doesn't this make you a little bit anxious, all these people together, <laughs> right? So you go from this, this crowded, crazy place where you can't walk down the street because there's people. Um, and I showed you this uh, slide here. How would you like to be a dental hygienist working in this clinic? Um, pretty exciting. They've got uh, the sink with the Marlboro. They don't have running water. Um, this is a Kathmandu uh, dental office. And here they have the, uh, for the walk-by, you've got your extracted teeth, just to, to demonstrate what the clinician is capable of performing for you. And these nice dentures here, which is uh, nice. But this is, this is, you know, 2019, November in Kathmandu Dentistry. And then you fly into, into uh, Bhutan, into Paro, and, and it's a different world. Um, very, very open. Uh, it's uh, carbon positive. Um, it's, uh, they, they set, I think 70% of the, the country is forested, something like that. It's just, it's a really, really great place. And the people there, um, 
the gross domestic product is happiness. So they're, they, very, they believe in wellness and, and staying healthy. But the country is very, very poor. The average person makes about $2 a day. Um, so that's, that's sort of what, how it goes there. And so I was part of this group uh, called Abroad. And uh, this is a group of uh, people from my MBA uh, that um, uh, we got together. And uh, it was part of a contentment foundation. So trying to determine mindfulness and um, uh, well-being and community and seeing what we could do for other people. And I got to tell you, these people were the most uh, accomplished group I've ever been with. Um, they were simply amazing. Uh, if you've heard of EA Sports, um, um, Marty was one of the uh, originators of that. Um, Chuck in the back uh, was uh, chief technology officer of PayPal. Um, and this fellow here, Emmett Keefe, um, he does digital transformations. So he, he's a venture capitalist and has 240 companies. Um, and they take companies and turn them digitally. So some of you may uh, have watched the Lego movie. Um, so Emmett's company did, did Lego, and they actually named the character uh, Emmett after, after this fellow here, this is Emmett. So really great group of people, and uh, we spent 10 days together. Uh, and uh, we, one of the things that we had to do was, the idea was to go to a monastery and stay at the monastery and, and sort of be immersed in that, in that sort of teaching. But I was, uh, I, I, don't, I travel fairly well, but I was terribly jet lagged in, uh, uh, in Bhutan. So I knew that we had to do this, but I said, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm, I'm going to go back down the mountain. I'm not staying over in this monastery, no matter how nice it is. I'm going to try to get some really good sleep. So that was my plan. So uh, the Contentment Foundation um, is, is a really fantastic organization. Um, and Emmett was bullied as a kid. And... Uh, his goal was to develop a program for children to, to teach them about mindfulness and contentment and self-curiosity in this. And his mandate is he wants to bring this program to 1 billion children worldwide. He's a, he's a really big thinker. And they have this organization which is really, really strong about that. So um, if you wanted to check out a little bit more about what they're about, um, if you look at the Contentment Foundation, they have these sort of four pillars that you can look at. They're easy cartoons. They're good to watch with the kids. Uh, they're short, but they, they're, they're very good. So back to, uh, back to the story. So the, the trip up the, up the mountain was about two hours. And it was, we had some really great conversations together. And the views were really nice. Uh, this is Tim Fu in the bottom. It has about 300,000 people. Um, and uh, I was interested to see all the prayer flags um, after our uh, uh, you know, our base camp celebration, they actually have them all over the place and they're, they're put there to commemorate uh, different uh, rituals and, and prayers that they have and, and commemorate different things. So it was really nice to see. I hear the, the prayer flags when they get a little bit uh, sun damaged, but they, they don't take them down. They just, they stay up there for years. So we're walking up the mountain and you get to the top of the mountain. So again, a two hour walk and you're into this area where there's this monastery and how it works is if you are a poor rice farmer and you're making 20 cents a day, the best thing that you can do for your kid is to send the kid to, to grow up in a monastery. And at least the kid's gonna be able to get some nutrition, they're gonna be able to, to learn to read, um, and they'll be in an area where they're, they're potentially safe. So it's, it's really, it's great to be able to, to, to put your, your child in this monastery. And, um, and so they, these, monks, they grow up together. And what's really interesting is they have the same diet. They have the same exercise, pretty much. They um, are on the same sleep schedule. So it's a very, very controlled uh, group. And here are the monks, uh, some of the, the boys were ready for us. So they had some tea ready as we came to the top of the mountain. And uh, they, they wear their, their robes. Um, and interestingly, although we came up a mountain, the first thing you see is an exercise bicycle. So that was really, uh, you know, it was kind of like, I'm really out of shape. I've got this exercise bike at the top here. And, uh, and here are the guys riding the, the exercise bike. Um, everyone has a cell phone, interestingly. So they're all on WhatsApp, if you can believe it. 
Um, and the, the connection, they just, uh, I think television came to Bhutan in the late 90s. Um, late 90s, late, maybe a little bit sooner than that. But uh, they've just really technologically coming into their, into their own. And one of the things that they love to do is they, they love to play soccer. And they've cut out this, this soccer field on the top of this mountain in Bhutan. And uh, one of their prized possessions are their, are their cleats, their soccer boots. So uh, they put together a program, a couple of uh, participants that they're canvassing to collect all the used soccer uh, cleats and sending them to the, uh, to, to the, the group here in, in this monastery. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was really an interesting, interesting space. And you gotta have, it kind of bends your mind a little bit about how you're thinking with things because we have our conceptions of how things look and, and others, you know, they look at life very differently. So on we went to the, into the Buddhist Institute. And uh, this place has been around for a long time, um, uh, since the late, well, 1779 it says. And you can't make a lot of noise. You have to wear traditional uh, dress, so your go or kira, and uh, you've got to follow the rules exactly. So really, really cool kind of place. Um, I'll take you inside here. This is, the, this is the gate that you walk through, and in the back are the, the housing. So that's where the, the, the monks live, and um, uh, everything is done sort of within this, in this uh, area here. Um, one of the things that, that was striking, um, and not a lot of people get to visit up here, we had special permission through our, our, our guides, is they're very big on epigrams. And I, I love epigrams, and I just, I was, I was really interested to, to read these, and everywhere you go, there is, there's an epigram. So this one, you know, uh, to be free from suffering, free yourself from attachments. So really, wherever you went, you had these, these different signs. And, you know, you'd stand and reflect and think. Um, education is not something you can finish. Uh, that, was, uh, that really struck with me as a, as a learner. I was very surprised to, uh, to see this one. <laughs> the truth is, you don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. Life is, crazy. Life is a crazy ride and nothing is guaranteed by Eminem. <laughs> so... Very interesting to find that in such a, such a spiritual place, um, but it's contemporary as well. So they put us in a room, and uh, this is the room that uh, we were supposed to sleep in, and uh, they had us change into our, uh, into our gowns, and the women had to wear their kiras, and the, the men had the goes, and uh, this is us getting suited up here, and you got, you got to put that. Fortunately, I had the haircut already figured out. So uh, I had no problem with the haircut, the, the, the rest of it, they, they needed some work. And then we had um, an opportunity to, to meet a Rinpoche. <laughs> now, I didn't know what a Rinpoche was. And I'm told that um, in, in the religion in, in Bhutan, um, they believe in reincarnation. So they believe that, um, that people right. are reincarnated. And you can determine this at a very early age. So before the age of two or three, um, if they identify someone who can tell them about their past life, then they're brought to the monks and the monks interview the child. And if the child is, uh, is deemed to be, um, uh, uh, has lived a past life, then they're given their temple and they're called Rinpoches or the precious ones. And they will live their life surrounded by people that will help them and, and they'll be revered. So uh, I'm told that if you are ever lucky enough to meet one, um, you'll probably be in a crowd of 5,000 people. The Rinpoche will come out and make an appearance and will bless you. And then, you know, you're, you're back in that big crowd. And uh, they arranged that we had lunch with seven of these. They collected these seven Rinpoches from different temples from Tibet and in um, and they were young boys. They were, they were young kids. And, uh, but these kids were, they were treated like they were really, really, like, like uh, extremely precious. Uh, and they were, they were really nice kids. We asked them questions and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a very interesting experience. So then uh, they wanted to give us a blessing. So we went into the, this temple and they started chanting. And the chanting was, uh, was really, uh, it was impactful. Uh, it was very deep and the floor would resonate and uh, it was a really remarkable experience. 
Um, but I have an attention span like a goldfish sometimes. And after about two hours of, of chanting, it was like, yep, I get in the chant. This is, this is, this is good. This is interesting. Um, and the, on the agenda for the next morning after we wake up is to wake up at 4.30 for another two hours of chanting. So this wasn't going to help my, um, my jet lag. So at this point, I said, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to stay. I'm going to go home tonight and, and sleep in my, at the hotel. So we had another exercise that we had to do. And you, if, if you want to leave the mountain, you have to do it before dark. Because in Bhutan, they believe that the evil spirits come out at night and they'll kill you in the forest. So uh, the decision had to be made by about four o'clock. So the two o'clock scene is another temple. We had a, a session on emotions and, and managing, um, managing our emotions. And the organizer um, named Justin Milano, he said to me, he said, Peter, you, um, you really should stay over tonight. Um, this is gonna be like a really fantastic experience and uh, you know, you'll never do it again. And uh, you really should reconsider. <laughs> And I was the only one that, um, that, that didn't want to, to stay. So I said, thank you. I, I'm going to make the decision, though. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to walk down tonight. So I felt bad about it. Um, and he said, OK, uh, when you're walking down, the exercise is that for two hours or an hour and a half, you don't talk to anybody. You just meditate while you're walking downhill. I'm like, I can do that. That's fine. So um, they had two guides with me. Um, and the guides, we left the, uh, the compound. Um, this is the, the epigram that we did. And as we got out of the, uh, the monastery area, uh, the guides, they stopped. They said, um, I'm like, why are we stopping? And, and, uh, this is, uh, one of the guides, his name is, is Poob. And Poob, um, pulls out this, this leaf. <laughs> and in the leaf, he has this paste and, there's a nut there. So this is betel nut. So I'm like, this is interesting. I've never seen this before. Um, can you show me how this works? And he's like, yeah. Um, you can see his lips are red, right? I don't know if you can see that on your screen. Um, lips are quite red. Um, and they consume this sort of all day, all day long. So it's the, that's the leaf with the lime. Yeah, and this is betel nut. You get it from India. Okay. Wow. Okay. And then you put it into a leaf. Yeah. And then and you... along this you chew. Okay. You chew, no? Yep. All right. And then that goes in your cheek. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And is it that? So you, you wrap it up, you stuff it in your cheek. And I'm like, Poob, why, why are you doing this? What's, what's, what's the advantage? He said, well, a few things. First, it, it gives you a lot of energy. <laughs> he said, so when I'm tired, I, I take this and I, I feel a lot, a lot, peppier. He said, um, when I'm cold, I take it and it makes me, makes me warmer. I said, anything else? He said, um, he says, my teeth don't hurt when I use it. I said, your teeth don't hurt. He says, no, my teeth don't hurt. My teeth feel better and they, they don't wiggle as much. I'm like, okay. And also I'm not hungry when I take it. Um, so it's an appetite suppressant as well. So I'm like, this is really interesting. And I'm like, does everybody use this? And they said, yeah, everybody. And it makes your breath fresh. So we give it to the children as well. And they, um, they use this and it makes their, their breath fresh. And, and it's, it's you know, something we've been doing for, for years and years and years. So Poob is, uh, when he's not a tour guide, he runs a radio station in, um, uh, in, in uh, Paro. And he's a very well-educated guy. And I'm like, do you know anything bad about this at all? And he said, uh, no, no, I don't know. I said, do you know that it can potentially cause cancer? And he said, uh, I've heard that, but I really, I, I'm not sure. I've, I've never seen that really. I'm, I don't know that. So I'm like, okay. So for the next 90 minutes, walking down the hill, down the mountain, I peppered the guy with questions nonstop. <laughs> We actually stopped at one point and I showed him some pictures of oral pathology that I had on my cell phone about oral cancer. And he was really taken aback that this stuff could potentially be bad for you. So as we're going down the hill and I'm a uh, mountain, I'm realizing what a special population you have here. You have a group of individuals who have um, 
grown up in the same place. They have the same socioeconomic, the same lifestyle factors. And Bhutan has the second highest rate of oral cancer in the world. So I'm like, this is, this is really interesting because tobacco is also uh, banned in Bhutan. So you can't use tobacco. So you've got a group here that, um, that is celibate. So you don't have the HPV action. You don't have tobacco as a confounding factor. And you have uh, this use of betel nut. So I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic to study this population over time to see if maybe we could figure out something for them to help identify that this is bad for them and uh, maybe have some sort of alternative. So I'm like, okay, this is, this is really interesting. The other part of it was um, the rate of decay is, uh, is not very high as far as I know. They don't have dentists in Bhutan, but cavities aren't a real big problem because the white paste that I showed you, that's calcium hydroxide. So, and they're using the calcium hydroxide to, um, uh, that, that would inhibit uh, decay for them. So I said, okay, let's figure out the economic impact of this. Who am I gonna tick off if, uh, if we decide to, to actually do this? So I said, Poop, we're gonna go buy some, uh, some betel nut today uh, on the way home. He's like, okay. So we went to a store and this is how you buy the betel nut. It's packaged kind of like this. And it's like a commodity, like, um, you know, like, like buying tomatoes here or, or, or flowers. And it's a, you know, it's about a dollar for, uh, I think it was a dollar for per package and you got five nuts in there. So about 20 cents per nut. And you go through maybe four or five uh, of these a day. Some people use more. Um, and when you chew it, it has this red uh, consistency to it. And you can see that people's lips are stained. And when you look at the side of their vehicles, they're spitting out the window. And you can kind of see this, uh, this red stuff everywhere. It's, it's disgusting. So I, I knew I wanted to do something in Bhutan. I wasn't sure what it was. At first, I thought I wanted to do a, a, a dental clinic to have some relief for the, for the people of Bhutan. But then I thought, I have a bigger calling here. What we can do is we can do a study um, and try to link this to oral cancer for the, for the, the population of Bhutan. And uh, to do that, um, I need some cooperation. So I'd already arranged to have a, a conversation with the Minister of Health. So we went and uh, talked to the Minister of Health and I pitched my idea about doing this study. And I'm like, are you aware that this is really bad? And they were like, yeah, we're aware of that, but you know, we really can't do much about it. I'm like, you can't do much about it. Like, they're like, no, there's so many other things that we have to worry about. This isn't really something that's on the, you know, on the horizon. We'd like to do it, but we, we just can't do it. And also, this is not a Ministry of Health issue. This is a university issue. You want to do a research study, you need to go talk to the university. So I'm like, okay, um, can you put me in touch with somebody in the university? And he said, let me make a call. So everybody knows everybody in, in Bhutan. He makes a call. This is Thursday or Friday. He said, I'll have an appointment with the director of postgraduate medicine on Saturday morning. I'm like, fantastic. This is great. So we went to... Um, uh, the, uh, the university uh, and uh, had an appointment with the, the, the director of postgraduate medicine. Um, another thing in the backstory, although they have the second highest rate of oral cancer, treatment for oral cancer really isn't done in Bhutan. If you develop cancer, breast cancer, or, or any sort of complicated uh, disease, head and neck cancer, you get shipped off to Thailand or to India, and there's a good chance no one's ever going to see you again. So because of this, um, people are very late to report when they, when they get sick. Um, so here we are at the medical school university and um, it's, a, it's an incredible place. They still have a tuberculosis ward, right? Can you imagine that? There's, that's still a thing. Um, so um, very, very interesting country. This is the university. Um, it's an old hospital uh, and the hospital was converted into these different rooms uh, where uh, this is the outside of the university. You can see the squatter and, and just, it's a very, very uh, interesting place. So I'm thinking what kind of quality of education will this person have that I'm going to meet? Um, because it, there is, you know, where did they train? Where did they do their training? I'm, I'm, I really want to, I really hope that there's somebody that we can, we can resonate with. And 
This is the office of the director with some curtains. It was an old, old hospital room. The bathroom was converted into a, a library and then the main room was, uh, was where the bed was. This is Malene Halund, who was also on, on the trip. You, you may have met her from, uh, she's an oral surgeon from, from Copenhagen. So we sat down with this guy and it turns out he's a veterinarian and he studies, uh, epi he's an epidemiologist and he did his PhD in Charlottetown. So he's Canadian trained. So I'm like, fantastic, we can, we can really work together. So I pitched the idea. He said, this is really fantastic. I, I love the idea. How can we pay for it? I said, you should see the people I'm traveling with. They will help us. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea is that we're going to go back to Bhutan. Uh, we're hoping to do it this November, but it's probably gonna be pushed out a year. And we're gonna do a study where we look at between 300 and 400 monks, do an oral exam. Uh, if there's any pathology, we'll take a biopsy and then follow this group um, forward in time. And hopefully by demonstrating to them that there's a linkage between betel nut and oral cancer or uh, oral submucosal or submucosal fibrosis, um, where the inside of your cheek gets really corrugated and you can't open, by, by showing them this correlation, giving them the information, they'll be able to make a decision if this is something that they want to continue doing. So uh, it's really, a, it was really a magical moment for me going down the, the mountain and having this, this epiphany. So uh, it's turned into a, uh, an international collaboration uh, through McMaster. Uh, University of Toronto has is, is agreed to do all the pathology. They're gonna read all the samples. Uh, the Kingdom of Bhutan is, um, uh, is, is very keen on doing this and we're also involving University of Copenhagen and, and Brock University. So this was the, the, the story of the ascent. And uh, I, I hope to keep you in touch about this um, when, we, when we meet again. So of course, this is a, this is a collaboration. It always has been. And uh, it's, I'm really thankful for your, uh, your participation over the last uh, year and a half. We're hoping to do a, we, we will certainly do another Basecamp 2.0. Um, it's gonna be virtual though. Right, so we just we can't all hang out together at Niagara College again. Although they were really kind with us, and they were they were so giving with their facilities and their students, and their support was incredible. And of course, we'll include them, uh, but we'll all meet we'll meet on this platform, and and uh, you know hopefully we'll keep this interesting for you. So uh, with that, I want to thank uh, thank you for participating. Uh, for those of you who have been through the whole series, you're wonderful. Thank you. And I wanna thank my team uh, for being so supportive uh, and uh, especially uh, Amanda and Louisa for, uh, uh, for their work with this. And uh, I, uh, I'm really thankful for, for your support. And uh, with that, I will uh, tell you it's my privilege presenting this to you. So thank you.